States will have 90 days after that release um, to apply. CMS will then review applications, um, select states that they think um, would be good participants in the model. Um, there would be, you know, negotiation of an agreement um, during the next month. And then the first cohort of states would, as I mentioned before, would not go live until January of 2026. It definitely takes um, CMS time to change their systems when they're looking at different ways of issuing Medicare payments. So next slide. During our discussions um, with CMMI, we provided um, some feedback about what we see as um, Vermont's priorities for future models. And some of those themes um, won't, you know, won't surprise folks, but we definitely wanted a model that would have support um, for rural provider um, stability and sustainability. And like other states across the country, um, we particularly highlighted challenges with workforce and healthcare inflation as particular concerns. Um, increasing predictability of payments is another area that we um, uh, emphasize in terms of our feedback. Uh, ensuring that any model provides the right amount of revenue for sustainability um, and really emphasizing that Vermont has been a low cost state um, for Medicare. We uh, focused on support for investments in preventive care and also community care. Uh, making sure that payment models and quality measures are aligned across payers as much as possible. And then also allowing Vermont to keep moving forward on our um, important healthcare reform and particularly care delivery reform efforts. So some of those include um, care for people with complex health and social needs, uh, support for primary care, um, using the Blueprint for Health and the Comprehensive Payment Reform programs as examples and support for community-based services. Next slide. So the announcement itself, as I said, September 5th is when uh, CMMI uh, made the announcement. Um, there's a link to um, the website uh, on this slide. The website's pretty robust. It includes an overview of the model, highlights, um, what's the purpose of the model. Um, they talk about three primary components to the model and three eligible categories of participants. Um, they envision a model governance structure uh, a statewide health equity plan is a um, key component of the model. Uh, there are frequently asked questions, a fact sheet, a press release, or a uh, um, high level comparison with other models um, that CMMI has. Um, and, uh, you know, just to, um, I keep referencing AHEAD, but AHEAD actually stands for States Advancing All Payer health equity approaches and development. So um, clearly there's centrality of um, health equity in this model. On September 18th, there was a national webinar. About 800 folks attended that webinar. So there's a, a high level of interest across the country um, in this model. And the slides and the recording from that webinar are on the website. And they're also, um, you know, interacting with individual states and particularly the provider community and states. So on September 26th, there was a Vermont um, provider webinar and somewhere around 100 folks attended that webinar. Next slide. So um, from here on, there's going to be a mix of slides and content that um, that we've developed to try and it's a it's a pretty complicated model. So to try and summarize some of the high level points um, of the model, and then we're also pulling um, 
information directly from material that's on the CMMI website for AHEAD. So you'll, uh, you'll see it noted when the source is the, uh, the AHEAD website. But this outlines um, the application and implementation timeline that they're envisioning. So they're, they're um, envisioning three cohorts. Um, you know, the first cohort would be the states that would be most prepared to move forward with this model. Um, again, that NOFO would be released um, within, you know, some toward the end of 2023. There would be that 90-day um, period um, to respond to the NOFO with an application um, that would take states into early 2024. And then for these, um, this first cohort of states, a shorter um, implementation period. So an 18-month implementation period from, um, say, July 1st of 24 through to um, January of 26. And then um, a, a total of nine performance years for those cohort one states. So this is a um, a longer C CMMI is starting to um, put forth longer models now. I think understanding that it um, can take some time to make changes of this magnitude. So that would be the first cohort. Um, second cohort, same timeline for the NOFO and the response, but a longer pre-implementation period, so not starting until 2027. And then um, the third cohort would have more time to digest and respond to the NOFO um, and then have um, that uh, a little bit sort of an in-between pre-implementation period um, that would again have them starting in 2027. So, so three different timelines depending on, um, on states' um, interests and readiness. Next slide. So here's some key dates. Um, again, the announcement has been made, the NOFO in late December or uh, late November, or early December. Um, we'll have more details then and um, anticipate a um, broad stakeholder engagement process. Then, you know, if it's late November, the an application should Vermont or any other state choose to apply, um, it, the application would be due somewhere in the neighborhood of late February or early March of 2024. Um, if we decide to move forward, um, AHS and GMCB staff will work together. Um, we'll continue to provide um, public presentations, again, a partner engagement process, public comment, and so forth. Um, then um, in the spring to summer of 2024, CMMI anticipates negotiating with states that they select. Um, some of the points of negotiation might include um, savings targets, um, what does you know, the payment model look like specifically, um, some of the state targets, um, and I'll get to those in a minute, that, um, you know, accountabilities that CMMI and CMS are expecting. Um, so that would be um, spring to summer of 2024. And then again, that pre-implementation period could begin as early as July for those cohort one states, 18 month period taking us to January. Then um, calendar year 2025 would um, would be, you know, again, the preparation for the implementation of the model. Again, should um, Vermont move forward with this, um, you know, we'd be looking for um, a bridge between our current model with Medicare and, um, and what um, 2026 might look like. And then, um, yeah, again, January would be that model launch for the first cohort. Next slide. So um, this is CMMI's um, sort of a head model at a glance um, graphic. So you can um, see that 
you know, they're um, they're couching this as a flexible framework. Um, they, you know, want to see it implemented in multiple states. The goal, of course, is to improve health outcomes. They they list um, three particular statewide accountability targets, and I'll talk about those in more detail in a moment. And three primary components, which I will also discuss in more detail, um, cooperative agreement funding, hospital global budgets, and primary care ahead. And then they identify five strategies um, for achieving the goals of the model. Um, equity integrated across the model, um, mental health and substance use disorder treatment integration, CMMI uses the term behavioral health throughout their materials. Um, that's not a term we um, use in Vermont. Um, an all-payer approach, uh, met alignment with Medicaid is a key component of the model as well. And then, um, you know, attempts to accelerate existing state innovation. So this is how they would show um, the model at a very high level. Next slide. So this is our attempt to summarize that in words. Um, when CMMI talks about their goals for the AHEAD model, it looks uh, quite a bit like the triple aim for healthcare improvement. Um, so improving population health, advancing health equity by reducing disparities in health outcomes, and curbing healthcare cost growth. So those are what they have outlined as their overarching goals. Again, the three components are hospital global budgets, primary care ahead, and the cooperative agreement funding. And they identify three primary categories of participants. Um, states, again, or portions of states, it could be regions, but um, states would be the applicants for the model, and there are um, some key accountabilities for states. Um, hospitals would um, also be um, participants, and uh, that includes critical access hospitals, obviously very important for us here in Vermont. And then primary care practices as well could choose to participate in states that um, are accepted into the model. And again, um, federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics are called out specifically. CMMI has made it very clear that a goal is for this model to include participation by safety net providers. Um, they believe that that's um, very important for um, advancing health equity. And then, um, five strategies um, to achieve those goals, again, um, outlined here. Next slide. So I, I'd like to just spend a minute on those three components to make sure, um, you know, that we're all on the same page on what they are. So hospital global budgets, um, the idea is that hospitals that join the model in those states that apply and are accepted um, would be paid with a global budget, which is um, a fixed amount of revenue. And they are um, really, CMS is really focusing the global budget on inpatient and outpatient hospital services. Um, and when they talk about the Medicare component of this model, they're really talking about Medicare members who are in traditional Medicare. So they refer to them as Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. So not, um, you know, when they think about the Medicare side, they're not thinking about Medicare Advantage plans. They would consider Medicare Advantage uh, plans and the folks who are members of those plans to be in the commercial market. Um, so that's hospital global budgets. Uh, primary care ahead. Um, primary care practices um, would have the option to participate in a model that includes um, a 
per member or per beneficiary per month payment for those Medicare, traditional Medicare members. Um, there would be a quality um, component and accountability. And um, it, it, they are saying that eventually, maybe as soon as 2027, there could be a track or an option for practices to transition into a payment that's more prospective or capitated type payment. Some of their other models have tracks like that. And so I think they're um, thinking that they would wanna offer a track um, like that for primary care in this model eventually. And then the cooperative agreement funding, um, it's, you know, what they're saying is that for states that participate, they would off, uh, provide up to $12 million in funding um, that would support planning and readiness and implementation efforts. And, um, you know, during that, um, pre-implementation period, but also the initial um, performance years of the model. So they're saying that a total of $12 million over up to six years. So, um, you know, not a, a huge amount of money, but some funding that could be supportive of, um, of preparing uh, for a model and, and the care transformation that would be part of the model. Next slide. So I'm going to first dig into um, what are the statewide accountabilities, and then um, in turn, I'll talk about primary care ahead, um, the hospital global budget component, um, health equity, and uh, model governance. So that's sort of um, where this is going. So again, this is a um, slide taken directly from CMMI's presentation, but um, their expectation in this model would be that participating states would be accountable um, for um, a number of um, measurements and targets and goals. And um, again, if it's the whole state that applies, then it would be statewide. If it's a region, then it would be um, the region. They would look at who are the um, residents that are in the whole in the state or region, and these um, these metrics would be applied to that. So the first is, um, and you know, they group these under their goals. So in the improving population health and advancing health equity um, realm, they have um, several targets. The first is looking again at those traditional uh, Medicare fee for service residents, um, they want to see increases in primary care investments. So they um, they want to look at what, you know, what proportion of healthcare dollars are being spent on primary care, set a baseline, set a target, um, see increases in that um, level of primary care investment. So they want to do that for the Medicare population and then also for the all payer population as well. And then similarly for both Medicare and Medicare fee for service and all payer, they um, expect the state to um, establish um, measures and targets for quality and um, health equity. So, um, you know, that and, and those quality um, and equity targets or TBD, there will, it sounds like there will be some parameters around them, but there also may be ability for the state to select um, measures that are most meaningful in those areas. And then in terms of uh, curbing healthcare cost growth, um, there is an expectation that there will be total cost of care targets um, for both Medicare fee for service and um, all payer as well. And that will be broader than your inpatient and outpatient services that are the subject of the hospital global budget. And that sounds familiar to us. We have total cost of care targets in our um, current model as well. And that's an ongoing um, 
concern and, and, and priority for CMS and CMMI. So those are the statewide accountability. Some, you know, familiarity there from our current model with some of these, some new things like the um, primary care investment and the particular focus on um, health equity. Next slide. So let's dig into um, primary care ahead. Um, and you know what they're you know they're putting forth a, a payment model for uh, participating primary care practices. They are saying that um, on from Medicare for those Medicare fee for service members that they're um, if practices choose to participate, there um, would be an enhanced per member per month uh, payment for those Medicare beneficiaries that would average about $17 per month. Um, there will be some adjustments to that um, based on um, social risk, which I'll get to in a moment, and state performance on some of those state accountabilities. But the floor for these enhanced payments for primary care would be $15 per month, and the maximum would be $21 per month. So they, um, as part of their equity strategy, CMS expects to see um, provider payments adjusted for social risk so that practices that are serving more vulnerable um, uh, folks would see um, potentially higher levels of support. And they also um, want to see some accountability for quality. So a small amount of those um, additional payments would be at risk um, based on the practice's quality performance. They talk about some of the um, elements um, that that the payments could be used for, and that includes infrastructure and also includes staffing. And they give some examples of that. Um, care coordinators, community health workers, mental health and substance use disorder treatment staff, um, all with a focus on supporting advanced primary care. And um, this felt um, pretty encouraging to us because a lot of this is um, work that we've been doing in Vermont for a number of years um, through the Blueprint for Health. Um, so our providers have been um, doing a lot of, of this advanced primary care work already. Um, and then an, another element of primary care ahead, and this really speaks to now we're sort of getting into the multi-payer aspect of the model, but they really um, strongly um, emphasize the importance of Medicare and Medicaid alignment, and certainly they want to see commercial alignment too. But one of the um, requirements for practices that participate in this model would be that they would be required to also participate in Medicaid transformation efforts. And one example they give is patient-centered medical homes. And again, this felt um, aligned with what we currently do in the Blueprint for Health, um, you know, patient-centered medical home recognition for primary care is a key element of, um, of the blueprint for health that's really foundational. So, um, so that um, seemed aligned and interesting based on the work that um, primary care has done in Vermont um, and the work of the blueprint. Next slide. So this um this again this is CMS slide CMMI slide but it shows um the um sort of the accountabilities for primary care under this model um, again um, you know care transformation requirements person centered care aligned with existing Medicaid transformation efforts so they um, group it into three areas. Um, health-related social needs, 
mental health and substance use um, disorder treatment integration and care coordination. So under the health related social needs uh, category, they talk about um, ensuring that folks are screened for health related social needs. Um, that there is work to um, identify and strengthen relationships with um, organizations that that uh, address those social drivers of need, of health, and then um, they um, and they discuss incorporation or embedding of um, social workers, community health workers. Um, or other staff um, to help coordinate resources for individuals with health-related social needs. Again, this sounds um, pretty aligned with what is happening in the Blueprint for Health and particularly um, the Blueprint expansion um, pilot that was approved by the legislature um, last session. So um, looks um, looks like it's, um, you know, really familiar and, and related to work that we're already doing. Um, in terms of mental health and substance use disorder treatment integration, um, in that category, the examples they give are reporting on mental health and substance use disorder quality measures. Um, we do um, some of that now. Um, our current model statewide has um, the statewide accountability. About half of the measures relate to mental health and substance use disorder. Um, there's a number of measures that really are reflective of coordination of care or screening and, um, and follow up uh, for depression. So we've got a number of measures in our current work um, that focus on mental health and substance use disorder. They um, talk about uh, developing warm handoffs to mental health and SUD providers and managing medications for um, people with complex uh, mental health and SUD conditions. So that's that portion. And then care coordination, um, there's a focus on um, on uh, referrals to specialty providers. Um, so they talk about, um, how, you know, practices developing work streams to establish those relationships um, with specialty care, um, how to formalize um, some of those referrals, including three, through e-consults and other agreements, and then fully aligning referral systems across Medicaid and Medicare. We'll need to see a bit more detail on this one um, to see what they're um, what they're referencing here. But so those are what they see, you know, here they want to provide more support to primary care. And then they also want to, um, you know, help use that support to um, transform care delivery. So next slide. So that's, um, that's a pretty high level overview of the uh, primary care. Um, the hospital global budgets in the AHEAD model, um, there's several key elements that um, I wanted to call out. Um, you know, the first is what is it and how generally do they anticipate that it'll be calculated? Um, so the um, global budget would be prospective, it would be a predetermined amount. Again, as I mentioned earlier, would um, be limited at least to start on inpatient and outpatient hospital services. Um, the calculations would be based on historical spend. Um, they did call out that there um, would be annual updates for changes in population served and um, for inflation. Um, Sarah will be, um, uh, Director Kinsler will be um, going into a good deal of detail on um, the work that we've been doing with a, um, you know, multifaceted hospital global budget technical advisory group where we've really looked at you know, how, what might we want to see in calculations of hospital global budgets. Um, the, here again, um, they will want payments to be adjusted for social risk and also for quality. 
um, they have indicated that there would be a bonus um, for hospitals that show improvement in health equity. And they also have indicated that in the first two performance years, um, there will be an additional payment that they're calling a transformation incentive adjustment. And um, the idea of that um, would be to support um, investments and in enhanced care coordination. A third um, element is that, um, you know, they, as part of the accountability, they would um, look at making adjustments to budgets um, based on total cost of care broader than the inpatient and outpatient services. And for that, um, and the next measure, they would look at you know, the, those fee-for-service Medicare members that reside in the hospital service area. So some accountability on total costs there. And then also um, what they're calling effectiveness and the example that they use um, for effectiveness of care would be avoidable utilization. What's the level of avoidable utilization that's happening? And then I wanted to um, direct call out um, this quote from their materials. Um, what they've said is that participating states with statewide rate setting or hospital global budget authority and experience in value-based care can develop their own hospital global budget methodology. CMS will provide alignment expectations for state-designed methodologies and will need to review and approve those methodologies. So um, wanted to highlight that there's a potential option for um, states um, that have um, done work in this space or that have authority to do work in this space um, to, to have their um, have state designed methodologies. So um, there may be um, some opportunity for some states to um, to augment or um, you know tailor a bit um, for that global budget methodology. And again, the work of the hospital global budget um, technical advisory group will be very helpful if Vermont. Um, decides to apply and go this route. Next slide. So this is CM, CMS's slide on, um, I mean, they have many slides on hospital global budget, but this one seemed like a, um, a good summary. Um, you know, they, they talk about um, an aim as being rebalancing healthcare spending across the system. So um, shifting utilization from acute care um, to primary care and um, community-based settings. So I felt like it was important to highlight that. Um, they describe, um, you know, what, what a hospital global budget is. Um, and then they talk about what are, um, you know, some incentives for hospital participation, what might, might make hospitals want to participate in this model. Um, again, that initial um, transformation funding for the first couple of years, um, you know, we hear a lot in um, payment reform, that financial stability and predictability are really important. And this, um, this model may actually um, provide a, a bit more um, predictability than what we've um, seen in the current Medicare version of the all-payer ACO model, but we'll need to see more details to know if that's the case. Um, you know, there's some ability to share in savings um, if there's reduced avoidable utilization and other improvements in care delivery, um, some potential to earn upside dollars, again, for improving health equity and quality um, with, you know, with the ability to really focus on population health. And then um, there, there are some care um, delivery 
Medicare waivers that um, may be available under this model that could help. Um, and I'll give an example of one that we're familiar with, which is that requirement that there be a three day hospital stay for Medicare uh, members before they um, can go to a skilled nursing facility. A waiver of that um, is a continued possibility in this model. And then they um, talk about system learning opportunities. So, um, you know, that's that, that's what they've um, put forth as um, what they see as potential incentives. Next slide. So I want to um, spend just the last uh, few minutes that I have talking about um, health equity. Again, it's obviously central um, to this model. Um, and CMS has put forth a definition. And again, I felt um, it was important to quote it directly. So they define health equity as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. And by the way, the emphasis is theirs here where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their optimal health, regardless of race, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic status, geography, preferred language, or other factors that affect access to care and health outcomes. Next slide. So um, this is uh, their slide that outlines what um, they see as the health equity strategy. Um, so it would include um, a number of elements. Um, the first, as I already had mentioned, as part of that statewide accountability, um, there would be um, targets for equity, and um, quality measures. And in addition, or as part of it, perhaps, um, there will be a requirement that there be a state health equity plan. Um, so that's um, the first element that they call out. Um, the second is enhancing um, partnerships between states, providers, and the community to meet model goals. Uh, third, I had mentioned earlier that um, safety net provider participation is a priority for CMS, and um, so they want to see um, that um, recruitment and participation from critical access hospitals, FQHCs, um, rural health clinics, and so forth, um, to ensure that um, vul vulnerable populations are included um, in the model. I had also mentioned um, social risk adjustment, so that would be present in both the primary care and the hospital global budget components of the model. And then I had also mentioned um, health-related social needs screening um, by hospitals and primary care providers to ensure that we're identifying um, needs and connecting folks to community resources. So those are the elements of, um, you know, of a health equity strategy that they call out here. And then next slide. Um, so one um, key element of the model is that they have um, indicated that participating states will have a multi-sector, what they call a model um, governance structure with a formal role, um, you know, an advisory or, um, you know, in some cases, um, I think in terms of developing that statewide health equity plan, uh, you know, so significant formal role in the work. Um, and they note that states can build on pre-existing work groups or um, boards. And then they do outline um, what they see as, um, as um, what, and what individuals should be on that governance structure. So they specifically call out um, patients or individuals and or advocacy organizations, um, community-based organizations, payers, and that would include um, commercial payers as well as the public payers, um, provider organizations, uh, local tribal communities, um, state Medicaid agencies and um, departments of health 
Um, so they, um, they um, you know, really lay out required um, um, participation or representation and then um, list a couple of optional um, uh, opportunities as well. And then um, the, the governance structure role um, would be to develop the statewide health equity plan and provide input on those quality and equity targets, um, review and support hospital health equity plans, and provide input on how that cooperative agreement um, funding would be used, and then um, some optional um, roles as well um, around the hospital global budget methodologies. Um, and um, other activities um, for the statewide targets. So, so that's um, that's a, a key component of the model. Next slide. So I'll close just with um, you know there's some questions um, that um, that um, we'll want to address between now and um, next June or July. The first is. Um, what do we do for calendar year 2025? Um, can we and will we extend the current model um, to avoid um, going back to fee for service? Will we apply for the AHEAD model? Um, will say we do apply? Um, will would we want to propose our own state designed hospital global budget methodology? Um, say we apply and we're accepted, would we be able to come to agreement um, with CMS um, on, on, a, um, on an agreement? So um, that's a you know question that uh, time would tell. And then what would be the composition of that model governance structure group? So I will stop there and apologize for taking until 1.55. I unfortunately do have a hard stop at um, 2 o'clock. So. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Jones, for that update. Um, we'll go straight to uh, Director Kinsler. I think it's topical because we have been working on developing our own state global budget methodology to propose to CMS as uh, Director. Jones mentioned. So, uh, Sarah, I'll turn to you. Thank you so much, Chair Foster, um, and thank you to Pat for joining me uh, today to share this content because I do think it is um, Pat's presentation on the AHEAD model and this update on the activities of the Global Budget Technical Advisory Group are very related, as you say. Um, so, for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, Director of Health Systems Policy for the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, as Pat mentioned, um, you know, Act 167, well, we, as Pat mentioned, we've used the slide before. Um, she was really focused on our, on our green box here on the subsequent, uh, a subsequent federal state agreement. Um, and I'll give you an update now uh, on our work to develop value-based payment models, specifically a hospital global payment method. Um, Act 167 really predates our engagement with CMMI around a potential multi-state model, uh, which you know, became the AHEAD model. Um, but I think Act 167 uh, was very kind of prescient in that um, in predicting that this would be a place where CMMI um, would want to go and where we as a state would also have interest in going. So um, that's kind of excellent alignment there. Um, and it has allowed us to really um, be a, a, ahead of the game, I think. Ooh, terrible pun, um, unintentional, my apologies. Uh, it's allowed us to be um, to act very quickly and in advance uh, to think about how um, a state developed hospital global payment methodology could interact with um, this new federal program that we're still learning more about with you know more more information to be uh, to be revealed as we get the NOFA. So I have a couple of slides in here that are um, a little bit of recap uh, and uh, content that you've you know seen some version of before, but I want to include it every time we talk about this since um, since it's complex work uh, and so much is coming um, coming at our board members and members of the public who attend our meetings. So as a reminder, um, we convened the Hospital Global Budget Technical Advisory Group. Um, in January of this past year. It is co-chaired um, by board member Robin Lunge and interim director of health reform for the agency human services, Pat Jones. So Robin and Pat 
um, lead our group. Um, and the charter is to really make recommendations for a conceptual and technical um, uh, for a conceptual and technical uh, specific specification for a multi-payer hospital global budget or global payment program. Um, as we learned more about uh, the AHEAD model, it became clear that uh, the charge included uh, to do that by the time CMMI introduces um, a future multi-state model. Um, we know that this will help us in a few ways. First, by um, giving us something against which to assess uh, the CMS methodology, the CMS developed methodology. And now that we know that there's an option for states to um, prepare uh, and propose their own methodologies uh, within federal guidelines, um, it, it means that we've already started that important work. Um, and, and so that will allow us to kind of uh, assess where we're at when, when more about the specifics of the methodology is released. Um, so again, we, we anticipate federal limits and guardrails for any state developed model. So I do want to say, just say out loud, and I think Pat uh, said this as well, um, you know, we, we anticipate that at least for m potential Medicare participation in any future global payment program or global budget model, uh, that we, we don't have um, entirely free reign. Um, but, you know, we're thinking, uh, we're thinking about how to kind of tailor um, to, to what Vermont, we think Vermont needs, what we think Vermont providers need, uh, what we think uh, will support the health of our population. Um, and, you know, toward, by the end of this year, um, we hope to have um, a fairly well-developed straw model um, specific, specific to Medicare, um, but identifying those places where we would expect Medicaid and commercial um, to potentially diverge or to meet their own um, additional work. Um, we meet about every three weeks for two hours. And we've asked a lot of these group members, so I want to um, extend my thanks to uh, any TAG members who are on the call um, for the time and effort uh, that they put into providing us with their feedback and perspectives. Uh, and all the materials are pu posted publicly, and the, that's linked in these slides. I think in a few places, um, you can find that on our website. Um, so we have been, as we have gone through the tag process, we've been working fairly methodically um, through a set of topics. Uh, and I'm going to bucket those. And, and as you see, we're, we're checking a lot of them off now. Um, I, I am bucketing those into three areas. Um, the first is around scope. Um, what, what's the scope of the model going to be? How broad are we going to get in terms of services, in terms of population payers? What kind of um, payer and hospital involvement might we get? Um, the second is the mechanics of actually calculating um, the methodology, which looks small uh, in, on this slide, but is in fact, um, I would say, um, a huge, a huge bulk of that work. There are so many technical details and issues to work out. Um, and then finally, um, an area that we're still exploring now and on which we'll spend most of the rest of the year, um, thinking about strategies to support transformation, uh, how the budget is administered and overseen, and how we monitor and evaluate uh, any any future global payment methodology appropriately to ensure um, that you know it's producing good outcomes for Vermonters um, that we're you know we have our eye on quality um, and access and all of the thing, and equity and outcomes um, all the things that we we know that we as a state care about. Um, so I'll review each of those um, in kind of summary. Some of them you've heard about because you know we had worked through these issues before we. Um, before in, in before previous presentations to the to the board, um, but some of them are new, and so we'll we'll give you an update. But I'll keep it brief where there's a recap, um, since I know we have other business to discuss today. Um, so in terms of the scope of the hospital global budget um, for the included populations, um, I think the upshot here is we, at least in our modeling and our conceptual work, um, we are aiming to think about this as broadly and inclusively as possible in terms of the population. So. We're thinking about hospital global budgets on a facility basis, um, and so we want to include as much of the population served by um, each hospital as we can. Um, so this goes into, you know, in-state, out-of-state residents, and I'm not going to focus on that today, um, but, but uh, in summary, we're trying to cast a wide net uh, and ensure wherever it's appropriate that there is cross-payer alignment. Um, secondly, included services. Um, we, you heard from Pat that in um, in CMS's uh, global budget methodology, they plan to um, limit their work to hospital inpatient and outpatient services, um, at least initially. Um, there was very strong 
interest among our technical advisory group members uh, in, including, um, in including additional services, recognizing that our current all pair model um, does look more broadly in terms of services, uh, services included in the model um, to include things like professional services. Um, and as we continue to look into the feasibility of doing that, we ran into some challenges related to um, data availability um, and kind of operational challenges. So um, where we landed in our straw model um, has been uh, that while we would start with hospital inpatient and outpatient, there are certainly enough, uh, enough methodological challenges to work out there to, to give us ample to work on. Um, we would seek to phase in professional services at, at a later date to give ourselves a bit more time to build the data infrastructure that we think is necessary to do that accurately. Um, and then this is, here is uh, an example of um, newly discussed information. This was discussed at our technical advisory group meeting just yesterday. Um, we had kind of a first conversation around um, what should the terms of hospital uh, participation be? And I should say, you know, our technical advisory group represents hospitals, it represents payers, there are advocates, uh, union representatives, um, health equity experts. So we've got um, a pretty broad array um, of of folks participating. Um, and unsurprisingly, we didn't achieve immediate, immediate consensus here, but we did receive really informative feedback and perspective from across that spectrum of participants. Um, so, you know, this is an area where we'll be having subsequent discussions um, with stakeholders um, and, and seek to engage our partners more on this area before we, you know, have any final recommendation. Um, so moving on to calculating global budgets and payments, um, I, this is largely a recap. Um, I want to note um, we're, we're looking at using, a, again, a facility-based approach that we're thinking about facility, a facility's net revenue um, for, the, for the services that are included in the budget, um, looking at a historical probably two to three year average. Um, uh, and as we look at the baseline budget, we are, thinking about potential one-time adjustments to the baseline to accommodate factors like um, hospital financial condition, including hospital operating margins. So potentially um, considering, um, you know, ensuring that we're not baking in losses um, to a future global budget, but again, um, not, not a final recommendation. Um, the baseline budgets would also need to include prospective adjustments for things like inflation trends, uh, membership and demographic changes, um, policy changes like changes in Medicare policy, um, as well as planned service line changes. So if a hospital were to plan to open a new service line to meet community needs um, or to reduce or eliminate um, a service line uh, because it, it's not you know, reflective of, of community needs. Um, then as we you know, start uh, moving through the years of our global budget methodology, and we'll kind of, I'll show you a, a um, kind of a, a drawing for that next. Um, we think about how to trend forward from that baseline. So there would be annual prospective adjustments, the same prospective adjustments that I just listed, um, but there would also be additional annual or ad hoc adjustments. Um, and those could include things like market shift, special adjustments for tertiary or quaternary service volume, um, special critical access hospital adjustments, um, which is uh, an issue to be discussed at a future date, um, uh, as well as performance adjustments. So as Pat said, uh, adjustments related to total cost of care um, is likely gonna be uh, something required by um, PMMI, um, adjustments for population health achievement, financial health, efficiency, service access review, all of these are on the table and we're kind of working to think through how they could be um, defined and operationalized and what the right balance of incentives is. Um, we're also, um, you know, when we talk about considering adjustments to mitigate provider financial risk, um, we wanna make sure that that's in fairly extreme circumstances um, and, and think about how to make sure that, uh, you know, the incentives toward um, providing efficient care and keeping your population healthy uh, remain in the global budget without being so strong. Um, that um, you know they they provide an incentive to limit access because that's certainly something that we um, would not want at all and something that we would want to really actively monitor for. Um, so here's the uh, kind of visual depiction of the straw model and it's really just showing the steps of working through um, a global budget. So you start with determining baseline payments. You figure out how to prospectively adjust. 
you make your year one payments and and then you know you're thinking about how to update and trend forward from there um i want to highlight that uh this straw model um is specific to medicare fee for service but again as we're developing the straw model we're identifying places where um, medicaid and commercial may need to differ and we choose to differ um and then finally, um, we are just barely starting our conversations about provider transformation, uh, budget administration and calculation, uh, and evaluation and monitoring. Um, so we had a very first conversation about transformation uh, at our TAG meeting yesterday. Um, and again, got great feedback, did not reach conclusions yet, um, but that is um, you know, not surprising for our group and it'll be something that we continue to discuss and work through together. Um, We'll have a lot more conversation about that uh, as we go along. Um, and then in our next couple of meetings, um, we'll be talking about um, global budget administration. So who actually does the calculating, how is the budget overseen, um, and then a monitoring and evaluation framework as well. And that'll be our work kind of from now through um, through December. Um, so again, as we as we work, we'll you know continue to build on that Medicare fee for service draw model, continue to um, think about how to adapt that, um, especially for commercial, um, which will probably start to take on in early 2024. Um, we're also anticipating providing hospitals with um, with additional modeling resources so that they can really play out what does this look like for them for their organizations. Um, and in the meantime, You've already heard about the key issues that we're talking, tackling. Um, we're also um, engaging with different constituencies, different groups, different partners, um, kind of outside of TAG meetings to get some one-on-one -on -one feedback. Um, and that includes um, meeting with hospitals, meeting with payers, meeting with other partners. Um, we're hoping to um, bring together some critical access hospitals to get some, um, some critical access hospital specific feedback on what policy adjustments um, or other um or other needs uh COD might have to successfully participate in this model um and then finally i just wanted to list for you kind of what we what we've got on the docket um or what we're hoping to address uh between now and and early 2024 so we'll we'll be meeting with Vaz toward the end of this month and hope to um, continue to engage with them um, as well specifically with critical access hospitals and we are um in the process of meeting one-on-one -on -one with some payers um, to understand um, where a model might need to differ for commercial payers and what how data intends to um, you know align with or diverge from any future Medicare model. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much, Director Kinsler. Um, why don't we take a quick five minute break before we turn it over um, to Ms. Melamed, and uh, then we'll turn to her when we come back. So we'll come back at two sixteen. Okay, we will reconvene and we'll turn to uh, Ms. Melamed, who's our Associate Director of Healthcare Policy, um, and she's been leading a lot of the Act 167 community engagement work. And I'll turn it to you, Marissa. Thank you, Chair Foster. Good afternoon to the board, members of the public. Can you see my slides? Yes, okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, hi, good afternoon again. Sorry, I was having a technical difficulty there, but I think it's all good now. Um, my name is Marissa Melamed. I'm the Associate Director of Health Systems Policy with the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm serving as the Project Director for the Act 167 Community Engagement to Support Hospital Transformation Work. I was meant to be joined by Dr. Uh, Bruce Hamery today, partner and chief medical officer of Oliver Wyman Healthcare and Life Sciences, who is the principal uh, contractor helping to lead the community engagement process, but he unfortunately had to cancel at the last minute due to illness. So it will just be me today giving you a project management uh, update and we will have Bruce back as soon as we can um, so you can hear from him on the uh, engagement plan approach um, and uh, updates so far. So um, don't worry, we'll have Bruce back, but um, I think I have some helpful updates for you today. 
So you all seen this slide today already a couple times. Um, Act 167 includes these four work streams. Um, the first two were addressed by Pat and Sarah. Um, the, the blue one there around the uh, evolving Green Mountain Care Board regulatory process, um, I'm sure you'll hear from healthcare finance team another day about, so we're gonna skip that one. Um, and uh, talk about the community engagement to support hospital transformation work, which is being led by the Green Mountain Care Board in collaboration with the Agency of Human Services. Um, just a, a really quick background on this work, which has been building for quite a few years now, uh, both in the work of Green Mountain Care Board and through the legislature. Uh, you can really date this work specifically back to 2019 and 2020 with the Rural Health Services Task Force requirement to provide sustainability plans in the wake of the bankruptcy of Springfield Hospital. And then in 2021, 2022, um, the hospital sustainability report um, and, and requirements to the that the hospitals provide uh, sustainability plans. And uh, then in 2022, with the passage of Act 167, um, which required these, these work streams um, being discussed today. So what I'm here to do today is roll out for you the public engagement process that's required by Act 167. <clears throat> uh, and this is to support the development of options for transforming Vermont's healthcare system to improve access, affordability, and sustainability. The legislature identified and mandated the community engagement process as a crucial step in matching potential options for our Vermont hospital and health systems with the unique needs of Vermont communities and regions. So what is the community engagement process? Who should participate? When is it? Um, and what are the expected outcomes? So um, the what, um, is community listening sessions and data sharing to gather input on the current state of the hospital and healthcare delivery system, unmet needs and opportunities. Um, the, oops, sorry about that. These meetings are divided into two categories. Um, community meetings are for anyone impacted by the healthcare system. So this is a, a broad net um, and provider meetings are for people who provide or help support healthcare services um, and this includes physicians, nurses, social workers, EMTs, pharmacists, healthcare support staff, et cetera. Uh, the process will take place um, in fall of 2023. So this is this week is when we'll we'll be launching the um, the you know the more public portion. Um, we've been working for for several months on the plan, um, and we're ready to launch uh, the public process, which I'm going to explain more to you um, in the next couple of slides. And then in spring of uh, 2024, there is a second phase. Um, and the outcomes or the outputs from these phases, the first one is a synthesis of input, uh, the input that's gathered from the community and the provider meetings and any interviews and focus groups and hospital meetings. Um, in phase two, the output is options for state entities, communities, and health systems. Um, and this will be in two rounds of uh, statewide meetings. So the first in the fall um, will be to gather the input, and then um, the Oliver Wyman team will come back to the communities um, to talk through the options and recommendations. Okay, so here's uh, a review of our progress so far, a uh, bit of a recap. So as directed by the legislature, the Green Mountain Care Board has retained an expert uh, to support the data-informed, patient-focused, community-inclusive engagement process. Uh, the, the expert that we have retained is the Oliver Wyman Health and Life Sciences Practice. Um, and they began in late summer by reviewing data and preparing to facilitate the listening sessions. Um, the listening sessions will gather local input to inform options for state entities, communities, and health systems to implement um, that ensure Vermonters have sustained access to affordable care. And they will be working directly with community members, businesses, hospitals, providers, and healthcare organizations to ensure a wide range of voices are represented in these discussions. Um, we also have help from um, a current 
data analytics contractor, uh, mathematical policy research, and they will provide data analytics support, particularly for the, um, the phase two um, around uh, impact um, and sort of forward-looking analyses of these uh, options and recommendations. So here's an overview of the phase one public listening session. That's what we're gonna start now. Um, there are, uh, we're about to launch the schedule of 32 virtual public listening sessions. These will be hosted and facilitated by the Oliver Wyman team on uh, the Zoom meeting platform. They are scheduled regionally by hospital service area. There will be 18 community focused meetings. So that's one per hospital service area. And then there are four scheduled as a statewide catch all. Um, there are 14 provider focused meetings. So that's one per hospital service area. The meeting times are varied um, from 4 to 6 p.m., 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. and 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. to try to give people options. Um, again, the meetings are focused around community at large um, versus provider and regionally. So we're, we are trying to capture regional insights. Um, however, um, there is, you know, people can choose which meeting is appropriate for them um, based on their location, um, what uh, perspective they bring, or even just the time that works for you. Um, and this schedule, um, runs from October 25th, so two weeks from today, through November 16th. Um, so it is um, a pretty tight and a sort of a full statewide effort um, over the next um, month or so. And then the meetings in this phase are what will inform the phase two meetings, which is the development and vetting of options with communities, um, which we do not have a schedule for yet. Those will be uh, will begin in the spring after a pause for our, um, synthesizing insights and analytics. And then the team will come back um, this time in, in, in person in some cases um, to talk through the findings um, and, and recommendations developed through the first round. So this is how the board and the public can um, at large can provide input. This is kind of the, the specific uh, ask for all of you on the meeting today. So for board members um, in phase one, we will share the schedule with you and we can talk about having you attend as listeners um, across these meetings so you can hear what's being said um, from, from people who attend. Um, in phase two, we would ask for board member feedback on priorities and options for transformation, you know, based on your areas of expertise um, and, and where you, you know, from your, from your position as a board member. For the public and impacted groups to provide input in phase one, um, we are, will, or the Oliver Wyman team will review local, current, and future state um, data to give people context um, and, and grounding and what is known and sort of what the healthcare system is facing. Um, and then they will be um, asking for members of the public to share their experiences, um, brainstorm, prioritize local needs, um, really get that um, local um, and community input. And then in phase two, um, when the team comes back, it would be to provide feedback on priorities and options for transformation based on uh, what Oliver Wyman brings back to the table. So finally, uh, at least for, for my part, we are asking folks to check the Green Mountain Care Board website soon for the full meeting schedule and to register for meetings. I'm sure when we get that posted, um, which um, we are working out uh, pretty much as we speak. Um, it will be available on the hospital sustainability page and I'm sure the next public meeting of the board, uh, we can have um, Susan or the chair announce that that's public so that people can go to the website. Um, we are waiting to launch it so we can have um, the ability for people to sign up directly um, for the meetings that they would like to attend um, and receive uh, uh, invite so it'll go on your calendar and make it um, easy as possible for people to 
uh, schedule and get information. Materials for the meetings will also be posted. Um, and I apologize, the writing on here is small, but I think this is helpful. There's a few questions that people might have. I think I've gone over some of them, but um, if you're not sure which region to join, um, as I said, it's organized around Vermont's 14 hospitals. Um, you're invited to join the discussion for any region that you feel connected to. It could be where you live, where you work, where you receive healthcare services. These can be different um, in different cases, but we are um, uh, uh, modeling the meetings around regions so we can understand um, you know, who uh, each hospital uh, serves and what their community needs are. Um, what's a provider meeting versus a community meeting? I think I, I probably covered this um, already, but again, community meetings are for Vermonters about their lived experiences with the healthcare system. Um, and the provider meetings are tailored uh, specifically for those who provide or help support healthcare services. And you can come to um, either meeting um, as it applies for you or if you um, want to listen. Um, and again, if you can't attend a meeting in your region, um, you should go to a meeting that you can go to. There are also other ways to provide feedback, as always, as Susan always starts the meeting. Um, we all have specific public comment um, that can be directed toward this project and will be shared with the Oliver Wyman team um, and included in their analysis. Um, so we encourage um, written feedback, video, audio recorded feedback. Um, we want to hear from you. So I'm gonna, uh, like I said, Dr. Hamry could not be here today. Whoops, hold on. There it is. Um, could not be here today. And the Oliver Wyman team actually has an offsite today. So we'll have to bring them back. Um, but we wanted to make sure to at least give you this update. Um, Dr. Bruce Hamry is the uh, principal on this project. He has um, an extensive and long career leading uh, large healthcare systems through transformation, um, as well as experience with rural hospital systems. He also probably sounds familiar to many of you as he uh, led the state's uh, wait times uh, workforce or wait, yeah, wait times, uh, healthcare services wait times uh, group. Can't remember the formal name. I think that's familiar to most people on this call. Um, and so he's back to, um, with great enthusiasm to help us with this project. He is joined by Elizabeth Sutherland, um, who has a background in systems engineering and management and um, has led several um, health equity initiatives um, with states. And she is the um, health equity expert um, on this project, which is a which is a priority uh, for this effort, and then they are joined by two um, project managers and subject matter experts, uh, Chidera Chikweke and Sam Winter, um, and they both bring with them um, quite a bit of background um, on the payer and provider space um, in in healthcare, um, um, and have been helping us to manage the project both on the um, sort of logistical and community outreach side um, and the data review and analytics side. So we're super excited about this team. We want people to be familiar with them. You'll hear from them. Um, they will be facilitating the meetings um, and uh, synthesizing the um, uh, insights. Um, and many people on this call have probably already talked with them and heard from them already because we have been reaching out to um, uh, impacted groups, community leaders, hospitals, provider associations, um, as we've been developing our uh, outreach plan to date. So um, I also want to thank all of the um, people that we've met with so far, um, legislators as well, to help us formulate the plan um, that we're now ready or getting ready to publicly uh, launch. Here is the contact information. Um, so as I said, I'm the, I'm the project director with the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I work very closely with our health policy analyst, Hillary Watson, who is helping me wrangle all these meetings and data as well. Um, and so please do not hesitate to reach out to either of us or both of us with any questions about this work. Um, the Oliver Wyman team's emails are also on here as well, so people can reach out to them directly um, and uh, just be familiar with who they are and their names in case you receive uh, outreach from them. Um, and here's the link to our 
website again, where you'll find the schedule once it's posted. I think that yeah, brings me to the end. So I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster, and thank you. Thank you very much, Marissa. Um, I'll open up to the board for any comments or questions board members may have. Um, I have one comment, which is for anybody that's on, I really encourage participation uh, in meeting with the Oliver Wyman team as much as possible. We want as many different constituents in our healthcare system and uh, patients, businesses, everybody as much as we can so that we get this uh, as informed as possible. I think this is some of the most important work that's being done in healthcare in Vermont. So I, th I really encourage as much participation as we can get. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate for any comments they may have. Um, Eric, I see you, but uh, I don't hear you. Nope. <laughs> All right, Eric does not have a comment today. <laughs> Uh, if you want to e email us anything, Eric, you can. Um, and with that, I'll open it up to uh, public comment. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've got several comments. I'd like to try and make them as short as possible. Um, I think uh, uh, I think that uh, on the <coughs> question of the, the public meetings, um, I think the, it makes a lot of sense for meetings with uh, providers. But in point of fact, that they all people always do this. They've always done it. Always sounds great. Let's ask the people what they want. I think that will get you nowhere. And the reason is that there's the the public generally has no idea, um, you know, how to make real choice real choices about what kind of medical care is available and where it's available. They just don't have they don't have any idea. And you can it's so it's just it's an exercise. And I just think it's not going to work. Um, the, the look to talking to providers, on the other hand, um, has would, would be valuable irrespective of what kind of stuff they came up with, at least in my view. Secondly, looking at this whole project, and as you know, I've made some made comments about your process over the last year or so. Um, I think that if looking at looking at it from 30,000 feet or whatever, um, I think that the what you really have two jobs here. And I think two jobs really, and it, it really doesn't. It really doesn't involve the feds. It really involves the way that you deal with the system. Uh, the first question is, can you save the university, the uh, academic medical center? Uh, that that may be gone. I mean, it is, the, 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 the people that really understand the system from inside already believe that the academic medical center is going to have to be sold to somebody. They just hope to somebody good like Kaiser instead of somebody terrible like UHC. Now you can. Uh, I know people will disagree with that, and we'll just we'll just see what happens. But the reality is that UVMMC simply doesn't have enough money. It hasn't had enough money since the since 2018, um, and the and doctors there are starting to walk with their um, will walk with their feet. The second huge job is to is to rationalize the small hospital network. Vermont has very low costs compared to the rest of the country. But the reason they have low costs is, is because of the UVM numbers. The UVM, the, and it, this data is including with, with Dr. Hamry. Read his, his, Dr. Hamry's analysis of this system has been available to you for two years. Um, that the, 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 uh, um, the, 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 I understand that the saying anything is like the third rail of some kind of third rail of politics. But the uh, the reality is that that the reason that your costs are low in the state and is that is because of what's happening at the UVM Health Network, and not because of the others. The smaller hospitals have costs compared to UVM on a population basis, which is the only one that matters. They have costs that are a third to a half uh, higher than UVM. Secondly. If you look at the quality, if you look at the PQI data, at the PAU data, at the data that uh, that is put out by all your consultants, including Hamry, okay, then the reality is that that the idea that we need 16 
fulls, I mean, 14, six full service hospitals in Vermont just doesn't make any sense at all. We, and you know, it just, it, 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 it just doesn't. And so what I'm hoping is that the, your, your, the, in, the thing that you're doing with Hamry and the sustainability thing, the original idea for sustainability came out of the, out of the board itself. It came out of Jessica Holmes. Um, but the but the nobody has I've never seen anybody really uh, that looks to me like they're willing to grapple with the reality. We if somebody thinks that we need we used to have is Bob I or when I started when I regulate when I had your job, Mr. Chairman, it was a lot easier I have to tell you, is that uh, is that we had we had sixteen hospitals. Uh, we've had you know we used to have a full we used to have hospitals in Rockingham. When in uh, two hospitals in St. Albans, hospital in Barry City, hospital in, in Winooski, those are those are all gone. It's just not going to work. Okay, there's just the, the there's just too many hospitals here, and the real really hard work is not with the feds. It's not. I Pat Jones is a real pro. She's been here a long time. I'm glad you're here, Pat. But the um, but the, the reality is that it's not up to the feds. The feds have no idea what to do with this. The real question is, can you rash? So the real question is, can this body, can you rationalize? Because you're the only one that has the power. The idea that 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 this the uh, that uh, one care Vermont had the power is a fantasy. You have the you're the only ones that have the power that can rationalize that system. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, uh, Mr. Carpenter. Walter, how are you? Uh, I think you're muted, Walter. Hmm. It, okay, it wasn't on mute, but I turned it on and off again. Hey, Owen, I missed you for the last couple months. Oh, I missed you too. Oh, God. <laughs> it's nice to GMC see you. Denied my GMCB fix, weekly <laughs> GMCB fix. I want to just go back to Pat Jones's presentation and all of these models she was talking about. It, it reminded me of what Winston Churchill once famously said about America, that Americans will always do the right thing only after they have tried everything else. And every time we deal with a new model, we have to deal with another new model and another new model because we're constantly doing everything else except the right thing. We're trying to avoid it. Another comment or question is the use of these buzzwords like equity, accountability, et cetera. Um, how do you have healthcare equity when a hospital in one region charges a different fee for the same procedure, say a lobotomy, than a hospital in another region. And when prices vary so much, because there's never really a fix on exactly what the price for this particular service is, because they can adjust it accordingly. How is the equity if there is such a word or meaning for such a word, observed or maintained in a situation like that. Because we've been talking about equity for, you know, ever since I've been involved in this, which is like 2009 anyway. What exactly is it? That's just one of the buzzwords. And I think, you know, in our so-called free market system, you can't do that because there's so much variation in what a hospital or a physician's practice feels that it can charge. And when you have people charging $30 for an aspirin that costs three cents, um, <clears throat> the incentive is to make as much money as you possibly can. How do you do that? When, and Again, the real problem with our healthcare system, if you can call it a system, is not so much that we need a new model from business people at CMMI, which I think we don't need at all, but it's another story, is access. 
is that we still have 44 to 50 percent Vermonters uninsured, underinsured, et cetera. And I don't see that problem going away with what CMMI is doing with this new AHEAD model. It's just like reshuffling the furniture. It didn't work this way, so let's reshuffle it that way while the ship is going beneath the waves. So <clears throat> I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Walter. Any other public comment today? I think I, I actually had a comment earlier that um, I, I just really wanted to say thanks for all three presentations. They're very different and quite there's quite a breadth of those topics, so it's sort of hard to uh, to summarize them. Um, but I I think all three brought up some of these issues that that Walter just brought up about about equity and about the importance of hearing voices from Vermont and all corners of Vermont about what Vermonters want from their healthcare system. So I do think there's really a, a huge value to that. And I and I applaud the work that's being done. Um, there's a lot left to sort out for the all payer model and how that's going to be implemented. But I, I really I do appreciate that the the participation in the advisory work, the advisory group that's going on, uh, the technical group um, from lots of different voices. So I, I, I do think that, you know, we can work together to to build a better healthcare system. It's a complicated system to to work with, but I'm I'm optimistic with this work, and I and I just want to say thanks for the, for the presentations and all the hard work everyone's doing with this. I do agree about the public engagement. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dave. And as you guys all know, we really do appreciate these presentations. They were great, um, really timely and informative. And I'm excited for all this work. It's really, you know, Dave and I just got here a year ago, I think last week, and this was all in motion and really critical to some of the challenges we're all facing. So thanks, everyone. Um, is there any old business or new business to come before the board? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And the motion carries. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.